Welcome to today's webinar. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is brought to you thanks to the contributions of colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is produced in collaboration with Healthy Places by Design, an organization that advances community-led action and proven strategies to ensure health and well-being for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. This webinar will be recorded. All speakers' views are their own. Guest bios and slides from today's webinar are available on our resource page. We will share a link to the resource page when the webinar begins. Stay up to date on all things CHRNR. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter by scanning this QR code with your phone's camera. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars, our podcast, and our latest tools and resources. Your facilitators today include our host, Erica Burroughs Girardi, with support from CHRNR communication specialist, Colleen Wick, and the collaborative learning director from Healthy Places by Design, Joanne Lee. We invite you to continue the conversation immediately after the webinar in our discussion group. Joanne Lee will be our lead facilitator and watch for a chat from Colleen for details on how to join the group after the webinar. Welcome to Creating Prosperous Rural Communities. Hi, my name is Erica Burroughs Girardi and I'm really excited for this webinar. Of course, I'm always excited for our webinars, but this one is the last in a two-part series called Rural America's Opportunity for Equity. You know, rural communities are rich in social and economic resources. Did you know that one in five Americans live in a rural community? At the same time, rural communities have some challenges. Residents of rural America experience higher rates of disease and earlier death than those living in suburban and urban parts of the country. Like most places, the pandemic worsened inequities in rural counties. And as we plan for a just recovery, we need policymakers and decision makers to leverage the assets in their communities for equity. However, we often hear from our audience that there are challenges with that. There are challenges with identifying those assets and convening the right partners to address barriers to health. Distance, technology, and limited funding are just some of the barriers we often hear stand in the way of progress. So we created this two-part series around rural health just for you. And if you haven't already watched part one, be sure to catch it on demand. This webinar featured Drew Walmart from Frameworks Institute, and Drew shared important tips for framing messages that underscore equity and justice. Today's webinar will introduce you to the Thrive Rule Framework. This tool was co-created by the Aspen Institute's Community Strategies Group and the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, where, as you know, or maybe you just heard, County Health Rankings and Roadmap sits. The tool is designed to support you in convening partners to leverage your community's unique assets for equity and well-being. Yeah, in a minute, we're going to learn more about this amazing framework and how you can use it. But first, it's important for me to mention that while this series was designed with rural health in mind, many of the strategies are applicable to other community types. Right now, I want to introduce you to the other members of the production team that's going to aid in your learning experience. And I'm going to start with our good friend, Joanne Lee, with Healthy Places by Design. Hi, Joanne. 
Hi, Erica, and hi, everybody out there in our audience. We so appreciate you spending time with us um, for this webinar. I, too, Erica, I'm really excited about this topic. I live in a rural community, so I'm really interested in the tips. But folks in the audience, I am going to be supporting you with fielding your questions for our presenters today. So whenever a question comes to mind, go ahead and open the Q&A box and type your question there, and I will be uh, organizing the questions I'm teeing them up for our time later on in the webinar where we'll have Marjorie um, and Chris field as many questions as we can. If we don't get to all of your questions, join us in the post-webinar discussion group because we'll have more time there to dig into your, to your questions. Um, I also want to encourage you to engage with us through the chat feature, which is different from Q&A, and our colleague Colleen Wick will tell you how to engage with us in the chat. Colleen? Hi, everybody. Um, like Joanne said, I will meet you in the chat, so you could just use the chat to share remarks or respond to questions we ask you during the webinar. Our chat conversations tend to be very engaging though, so if they are too distracting, simply close the chat window in Zoom. If you have any questions for the panelists, use the Q&A box, just as Joanne described. Um, now, I would like to introduce you to our technologist, James Lloyd. James? Hi, Colleen. Thank you so much. As uh, Colleen mentioned, I'm uh, providing, te providing technical support. And if you do encounter any technical issues, please uh, uh, either send the email to us or use the Q&A pod, and we can help reply to you in that way. I'd also like to remind everybody that we've enabled closed captions. And so for people who would like that assistance while they're watching, uh, you can turn that on in the Zoom uh, toolbar at the bottom. So with that, Erica, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks, James, and thank you all to um, for everything you do with with um, those of you on our production team who make our webinar so special. I'm actually trying to delay what I have to say because I feel like I'm going to sneeze, which is always happens sometimes when you do things live. Hopefully, I won't. <laughs> but um, I hope you're enjoying this beautiful image that you see here. And while you're looking at it, I want to ask you this question: Do you know that we have the power? in the knowledge to build a transformed and sustainable future where everyone thrives while embracing diversity that makes humankind beautiful. You know, as you gauge in today's webinar, think about how the Thrive Rule framework can help us live out this truth. Like, how can we apply this tool to help us build a transformed and sustainable future? So just, just kind of keep that question in mind. And I certainly hope you're watching this webinar with your partners. If you're not, don't forget that our webinars are always available on demand the day after they stream live. So definitely plan to you know, create a watch party at a later date because you don't wanna miss the opportunity to process together what you're gonna learn today. And for you to together think about how you're gonna be able to apply this tool to the work that you're doing to advance equity locally. And then don't forget about our post webinar discussion group that Joanne was telling you about. This is really the place to unpack what you're going to hear today. So please continue to plan to um, please plan to continue that discussion with us. And during the video intro, you heard that our discussion groups do follow immediately after the webinar and they are facilitated by our friend Joanne. They're always engaging, giving you an opportunity to share and learn from others. So definitely plan to join us. Colleen's going to chat out information at the end of the webinar so you can link to the discussion group. And I know that Chris is going to join us in the discussion group to share a little bit more um, and make sure that he's able to answer your questions about the, the framework. So with that, um, let me introduce you to our guests. And I am going to start with Dr. Marjorie Givens, who is the Associate Director of the UW Population Health Institute. And Marjorie also serves as the Co-Director of County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. Hi, Marjorie. Hi, Erica. So good to be here today. Thanks for having me. Oh, and thank you. This is Marjorie's first appearance that I can remember on one of our webinars. So I am really, really excited to have you, Marjorie, and thank you so much. And I'm also pleased to introduce you to Chris Estes, the co-executive director of the Aspen Institute's Community Strategies Group. Hi, Chris. Hey, Erica. Uh, thanks for having me. Really excited to be with you and the audience today. Good. I'm glad because we're going to pick 
your brains today. <laughs> We're going to explore these questions with Marjorie and Chris as we learn more about this tool. First, we're going to talk about what is Thrive Rule and where did this initiative begin? Hmm. We're going to talk about the purpose of the Thrive Rule framework and how is it different than other frameworks. But most importantly, we're going to talk about how you can use this framework in our work, especially our work to advance equity. And so we're going to kind of dig into that um, in this webinar. So with that, let's get started. Marjorie, I, I'm hoping that you can help us set the stage before we learn more about the framework. What is Thrive Rule and where did this initiative begin? Thanks, Erica. Thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit about the origins of this project. So back in 2019, when we were presented with the opportunity to join Aspen Community Strategies Group in this work, we jumped at the chance. As you noted, Erica, one in five people live in communities and Native nations across the rural United States. As we know, the vast majority of counties are rural. So we really see an urgent need to understand and address the barriers to opportunity and health across rural communities and Native nations. Um, Aspen Community Strategies Group, in partnership with us at the Population Health Institute and with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, set out to explore ways that we can bridge the fields of community and economic development and health and really mm -hmm. synergize our efforts in bringing forward the change strategies that are needed to address rural, racial, and class inequities. And this became Thrive Rural. And as you'll hear from Chris in just a minute, this is an ambitious effort to create a shared understanding and collective action around what it takes for communities and Native nations across rural United States to be healthy places where everyone belongs, lives with dignity, and thrives. Yeah, that that's beautiful, um, Marjorie. And um, I want to um, ask you a little bit more about the framework now, now that you set the stage for how you all came together, what is the framework and how was it created? Yeah, so as a first step in our collaborative efforts, we really set out to develop this framework that you're describing, uh, grounded in what the evidence says and what change makers in the field have realized needs to be true for communities and native nations across the rural United States to thrive. So the Thrive Rural Framework is a tool to catalyze thinking and action differently to be able to achieve equi equitable prosperity for rural people and rural places. Uh, this framework is directly informed by rural practitioners and researchers and weaves together the current community innovations and tested approaches for a wide range of issues. Uh, this framework recognizes that healthy and sustainable economies and communities requires access to affordable housing, to child care, to health care, mm. support for workforce development, access to transportation, broadband and natural resources, all the things that we know are important for thriving. And these issues are all interdependent and must be addressed collectively to see the change we need. So to formulate the Thrive Rural Framework, we worked with advisory committees, numerous local and regional organizations, national networks and research partners, all with diverse expertise in these issue areas over the course of several years. Wow, I love that. I love the fact that it's encompassing so much that's that's critical to um, the success of of all economies, of all community types, but we do see those challenges in rural areas, like you were saying, around broadband and some of the technology and some of the other things that you mentioned. I'm glad that the framework captures that. You know, a lot of us in um, public health hear about frameworks. In fact, I've heard about frameworks for most of my career, but what, what makes this framework different than an, any other framework? Yeah, I think as we all know, as public health practitioners and, and actor, actors in our community spaces, there are lots of tools in the toolbox. And so this is a framework to bring into that toolbox, um, acknowledging that a lot of the frameworks that we work with and use address the life ingredients, as we call them, that are needed to survive and thrive, things like housing and transportation, education uh, and food uh, security. The Thrive Rural Framework really helps to nurture a shared understanding of what is needed to help produce these life ingredients. So, mm. for example, shared thinking and goals and people and leadership readiness and the ability to understand and act together. And I'm really excited for Chris to join us and, and share even more. Yeah, thank you so much, Marjorie, for kind of setting the stage. I'm going to circle back to you um, before the end of the webinar, but um, this is a good time to to bring Chris um, back to the mic. So welcome back, Chris. And I want to start by getting you just to tell us a little bit more about Aspen Institute um, Community Strategies Group, and then we'll go from there. We often call it CSG. So tell us about yeah. CSG. 
Sure. So um, CSG uh, Community Strategies Group has a long history at the Aspen Institute, formed way back in 1985. Um, it had a couple different names. Um, its work is uh, the three fourths of its work is really centered on rural um, efforts from the beginning. Historically, it was uh, it focused on sort of three large buckets. One was community development philanthropy, sort of building up uh, investments in community foundations, uh, two generation family support models, looking at parents and children um, together in interventions, um, and regional economic development. And these were sort of seen as gaps in the in the work and and um, the previous efforts really were centered around that. Mm -hmm. um, in the last, as Marjorie mentioned, uh, really things sh shifted into a much more formal hub role starting in 2019 when um, CSG did some deep research work on what we call community rural community development hubs and the idea that there were these innovative organizations that could be Sometimes it's a community action agency, sometimes it's a community foundation, sometimes it's a CDFI, it could be in many different um, fields, but plays this convening and connecting and sort of facilitating innovative and uh, inclusive work. And that really led us into this uh, project in partnership with UWPHI and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, to really look at um, what sort of thinking first from a systems level and then from a local level, what will it take to sort of achieve this ultimate outcome and what needed to be true. Um, and that work really took us from 2020 to 2022 and then really now moving into a more formal support building and supporting the field going forward. Awesome. And, you know, I love the fact that I'm hearing over and over and over this idea of um, prosperity, economic opportunity, you know, as we heard from Marjorie, like one of the most important features of the framework is that focus on rural prosperity. What do we mean by equitable ruin, rural prosperity? Like kind of share it, what you mean by that? Yeah, so I'll start just by noting uh, my own sort of lived experience has been rural and I've really enjoyed watching the uh, the folks attending the webinar sign in from where they've found many places uh -huh. that I actually have some lived history um, in both uh, uh, rural Connecticut and Massachusetts and North Carolina and Virginia uh, growing up. Uh, my mom lives in Western North Carolina in a little town called Waynesville. My dad lives in Northwestern Connecticut in a little town called Salisbury. And um, I moved to DC from Raleigh. And so we bring all of that kind of history of rural and how um, different it is in um, not to mention in different parts of the country, but rural's often um, fixated on a kind of economic development sort of deficit framework. This idea that what don't we have? How do we attract stuff here? What have we lost? And um, rather, and we really wanted to shift to this much more uh, uh, comprehensive lens of prosperity and, um, and that sense of equity being centered in that. Um, three bullets I just wanted to highlight on this slide. Okay. One is the um, in the why rural, this idea that rural is not monolithic, that there are, and the images that are portrayed in the media and the narratives are generally all around agriculture. Um, and yeah. it's usually either this sort of farming, idyllic, pastoral kind of view, or it's a sort of rust belt, um, you know, foreclosure, opioid epidemic kind of negative deficit view, and that rural is much more medium and small towns. It's, um, it's very diverse um, and um, very different in different parts of the country, but has some common themes and threads. The other P, another piece in the center I wanted to highlight is that people of color produce 83% of the rural population growth in the previous decade. Um, and we expect that to be even higher in the, in the most recent census. And so the stereotype that rural is sort of all white um, is, um, it really misses the diversity and um, equity issues within that. There are equity issues within um, just poverty, um, regardless of race, but that dynamic of the complexity of rural is something I think the media misses a lot. And then third, this, this um, notion that the rural is 
there's this interdependence and interconnectedness between rural and urban and suburban communities and that where um, both food and manufacturing and innovation and energy are produced, the, um, where most of the land and water and other resources are captured is in rural. And the notion that rural really needs to see itself represented and valued within the national dialogue in order for our sort of both national economy and our national democracy to persist, that there really needs to be this recognized interconnection. And that's why we felt like focusing on this was so important um, yeah. for everyone. Thank you for pointing those out. This is probably a good time for me to remind you all that we do have um, a link to the slides so you can follow along. And I know that Colleen's chatted that out. I'm gonna ask her to chat out one more time just for those who may have joined us since she chatted out the first time. You can link to the slide on our webinar resource page. So you can see these images a little bit better once you have them pulled up alongside um, Chris. So, um, but thank you, Chris, for pointing that out because you're absolutely right about the stereotypes that we sometimes don't even realize we hold, right? And it's all because of what we see all the time in the um, in the media and we'll, um, we'll uh, places in our country are increasingly becoming diverse. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, you know, and speaking of that, because I want to talk to you about um, this, this, how the, the framework is committed to dismantling structural discrimination that we sometimes see happening in all, all communities, not just rural communities. First of all, tell us what do we mean by structural discrimination and how is the framework committed to dismantling that? So um, in the development of the framework um, early on, with um, Marjorie and her team and the other uh, advisory groups and, and um, theory of change working groups that we were working with, there was a real discussion as we were looking at the building blocks of sort of where equity sat mm -hmm. in this notion of discrimination and, and recognition that there are, there's equity issues and then there's sort of structural barrier issues. And we really spent a while teasing that out and recognizing that there really needed to be a foundational element that cut across the whole framework that acknowledges the intersection of these three kinds of structural discrimination that everybody in rural has some connection to, that it wasn't just about the sort of um, a more, uh, I guess, easily focused on, which is the racial equity dynamic, but recognizing this intersection between race, place, and class, mm -hmm. and that, um, people, everybody in rural places is struggling with the barriers related to these intersections. So some people are clearly have had a history of structural participation in the economy and wealth building and access to capital because of their race. But people who live in rural, generally, regardless of race or gender um, or religious affiliation or sexual orientation, right? face discrimination because they're in rural places, the, hmm. the access to funding, the sort of isolation, the fact that most of the metrics for funding um, are set are urban center, um, the, the sort of number of resources and uh, the scale of things is just more dip makes things more difficult at times in rural. And then the acknowledgement that class is still an important understanding, just the expensiveness to be poor. You know, how people, um, you know, whether it's taxation systems or just fines or what it costs to access services, um, the, the sort of barriers for that low income people face cut across all aspects, whether and that's certainly common among both urban and rural places, but that that's part of that. If we're going to get towards um, real sustainable prosperity and not just sort of uh, increases in employment, which is often the more typical measure, um, we needed to acknowledge that there's a history of these sort of structural barriers, and we need to be mm -hmm. looking at them both locally, but also in the larger sort of systems of sort of um, what rural communities need to um, thrive and be prosperous. Yeah, I love the fact that the framework takes into account all of these dynamics that are happening all at once at any given time when you are in a community. So um, I know folks are, are 
dying to know a little bit more about what they would find in this mm -hmm. framework. And so here's an image. You absolutely folks cannot read it. So don't try. It's okay. <laughs> Chris is actually going to break this down for you so you'll be able to see yeah. it a little bit better. But when we were planning for this webinar, he said, I just want everybody to see the breadth of what's in the the framework and so what i want you to do is tell us at once like what is what are these building blocks what does that mean and then we'll tease them apart right and so the best way for folks who are interested is to go to our web, website aspencsg.org and you can click on the thrive rural link and um you can see the frame there's actually a uh, handout that'll walk you through the framework and you can see it in much closer inspection, but you can also walk through each of the building blocks. And as you click on a building block within the local or systems level theory of change, um, there's research behind it, which UWPHI has um, organized for us. And then there are other resources related to the building block as to how that sort of works in action. So what I wanted to give you guys today was to sort of understand how it's organized. So there's a local level theory of change which are the things made up of the building blocks or the elements that um, individual rural communities or regions can act on by themselves. So sort of within what we call the line of sight or the control of the, of the rural region uh, and community. And we've organized the building blocks into three large buckets on, under both um, uh, theories of change, rural voice and power, equitable aims and design and resources for productive action. So you'll see those repeated. Um, I will uh, go through, if you go to the next slide, we'll just go through them one at a time. So it's a little okay. easier to see it in a segment. Yeah. So rural voice and power, you can see one of the things that were, I think two things that um, really stand out for us is this welcoming notion that welcoming and belonging is a really important piece for success regardless of where you are, but particularly when you think about rural where communities of color or low income people have felt largely excluded from decision making um, and participation. And, um, but also the new population, the fact that rural places are full of people who have migrated to that place, whether they're from historic, you know, they're coming in a sense as immigrants to the country or just from other places. There is this, how we're creating a sense of welcoming and belonging is really important. And we see that thread happening a lot um, uh, in local places. And the other is this sort of strengthening local ownership and influence. And this is a big point of distinction for us is we're really trying to get rural places in general to move away from the traditional framework, um, which is um, attraction and extraction. Like how do we make ourselves as cheap and unregulated to attract the business? And then what, what resources do we have that can be extracted out, whether that's land or resources in the ground or water or whatever it is to this like shifting to a model of how do we create a better pipeline to strengthen local ownership opportunities for everyone and um, so that the wealth can remain in the community. Yeah. I love that. I love that idea. Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide. But before we do that, I'm just curious for um, in terms of our audience, can you chat, chat, if you will, how you have seen your rural community shift in terms of um, demographics? You know, Chris is talking about how they are becoming more racially diverse and we have immigrants that are moving to our rural communities. I would love to hear how that's happening and how you are seeing that play out. Um, Chris, I love the fact that this framework is actually helping people in rural communities think about how they can strengthen local ownership. Because even though I don't live in a rural community now, I did before. And what you said just so resonated with me when you said lowering the taxes or whatever so people can just move in and, and extract what we have. And I saw that happen in the community that I lived in in South Carolina. So I'm glad that the framework is addressing that. Let's talk about this piece, like the equitable aims and design that we see happening in the framework. Right. And I should add that the framework is not designed to sort of flow left to right or right to left or in, or in sort of order. So um, it may be um, 
confusing that way a little bit, but to think about, so we hear in equ equitable aims and design, it's really about um, how are we um, setting goals and designing um, our, um, our community so that everyone can be successful and have an opportunity um, at prosper prosperity and thriving. So you can see building from current assets really builds off that idea of local ownership. Like what do we have in our community that are assets that we should be centering on? And that should be um, a comprehensive view of that rather than just um, the sort of natural things that people often think about. Like what is the people's expertise and the organizations in the community and its history and um, all of that stuff. You know, if you have a historic element to your community or, uh, and again, centering it from assets rather than deficits. Uh, the other thing you'll see in both the systems, you'll see this balanced development goal. So the idea that we need to set goals that balance built infrastructure, the environment, and all the sort of components to success, rather than thinking like more from an exploitation framework. Doesn't right. mean that the natural assets can't be part of the, the development and, and prosperity plan for community, but doing it in a way that balances it towards longer term sustainability Mm -hmm. And sh and so, whereas traditionally, for example, you think of um, places that had a lot of like coal extraction or mm -hmm. natural gas, where the the focus was really on the extraction, and then after that ended, the communities were left with a lot of environmental degradation and cleanup. Um, so let's jump on to the next one. Um, yeah, and I'll just gonna just add not only a lot of environmental degradation and cleanup, but just that disinvestment tended to pull the economy down in those communities as well. So um, also, I just want to thank you for reminding us that this is not, these actions are not linear because all of this is happening at one mm -hmm. time. So um, we just have to lay it out linear. We have to lay it out in a way <laughs> that you can understand, but go ahead. So if you think about the third bucket is resources for productive action. And, and um, obviously one of the common refrains in rural places is not enough resources. And it's been somewhat, um, I think, important in the, in the last two years or so as the Biden administration has pushed a lot of resources out to recognize that just the fact that there's more money out there doesn't mean that it's getting to the rural places that need it most. Because part of that having an, organiz or an organized and action infrastructure is having the capacity to actually access that money. And that's a, a piece that we've been working with with a number of other national organizations and local practitioners to try to educate the administration and agencies about, look, if you wanna get this to the places that need it most and not just the places that can quickly take advantage, we're gonna to have to incorporate some real capacity building long-term investments, not just technical assistance and grant writing. And um, so that's, that's one of the places uh, that, I wanted to highlight. The other piece I wanted to highlight is acting as a region. We really emphasize both in the local theory of change and the systems theory of change that regionalism is an important element and that um, the history of rural communities seeing themselves as sort of competing with one another, particularly in, in a sense, the closer the proximity, the probably the greater competition. Um, which creates a sort of um, a crabs in the bucket metaphor. If you've ever seen crabs that get in a bucket yeah. and you to pull one out, the yeah. others will hold it back. Yeah. Um, rather than thinking about how can we work collaboratively to combine our resources and expertise and visions for what we want for our communities as a region, we're gonna, uh, we have a lot more to work with and we stand um, to, do, to make a more comprehensive and successful um, plan. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at the building blocks mm -hmm. one more time. Tell us a little bit more about this was the local level right. and then there's a systems level. So, so this is how it looks together again. Uh -huh. and, um, and the way we've sort of encouraged folks to think about this, we'll go through the systems level uh, right after this, is to Got it. start with the issue that you are concerned about. And then think about what building blocks resonate with you with the issue and thinking about where are we doing work that may sort of fit in this building block and what building blocks seem to make sense, but we aren't, nobody in our community is really doing that or someone else is doing that, but we're not really working with them. 
And it's designed to sort of help people think about what are those essential elements that are being addressed and need to be focused on. Maybe they're being done in a disconnected way, or maybe they're not being addressed at all. And so that's when you look at the framework as a whole, that's a, uh, the way we try to translate it into those um, life ingredients that um, Marjorie talked about at the beginning. Right. Right. So we're going to look at another aspect of the framework, and that's at the systems level. Let's go through that. Right. So here you see um, rural voice and power again. And we talk about the narrative question that I brought up before, which is, you know, as a system wide, we need a more accurate and positive rural narrative that also acknowledges the challenges and histories in rural places. And I wanted to, to back up and note we've intentionally included in that um, ultimate outcome that Marjorie read, we, you'll notice we include um, tribal and native nations. And so yeah. often in rural, the, the tribal and native issues are sort of done separately because they have their own governance issues and their own funding streams within the federal government, but we are very intentionally including them in this. And so all of that, the sort of foundational element and all the building blocks are designed to be relevant, but maybe applied somewhat differently in tribal and native communities, but all the work that we've tried to do around the framework, we've really tried to make sure we have some tribal native voices in that to sort of support people's work on this. And certainly the narrative is part of that. The other is you'll see the rural voice and design and action. So that power building of having people who've been excluded from um, decision-making, or um, particularly that often happens by the sort of traditional powers that be in rural, it's really important to be looking at how to change that and how to be more yeah. inclusive. And that often connects back to some of that, that leadership building block that you saw earlier in the local level. And so the building blocks will connect with one another on that. And again, all of these came from folks working locally across a spectrum of issues in, in rural issues. Uh, and, and our work was really to synthesize and align them in a way that could kind of um, be utilized, but um, these were really their, their advice to us. Yeah, I love that. You, you know, really listening to what people say their challenges are responding to challenges as they are shared with you um, rather than making those assumptions. So let's look at the equitable aims and design now from the systems level blocks right. as opposed to the local. So you can see again, balanced development outcomes. So we talked about the goal setting locally being balanced, but then needing that the systems needed to have balanced outcomes. So in other words, if you're, if you're trying to develop some, some balanced goals locally, but all the funding sources are requiring are not allowing you to do that, then that's going to make this work difficult. So part of our, we'll talk about measurement at the end, but part of the measurement piece that we developed again with um, input through our Thrive Rural Learning Action Learning Exchange was to develop a set of principles around measurement for how to do a better job of measuring success in rural differently. And um, this key about measurement indicators and um, changing the way philanthropy and government do work is really important. And, and that piece has a set of recommendations for each principle that are targeted to philanthropy and government, um, as well as practitioners. So you can see that element in there. You also see the cohesive policy lens that often in rural, one of the challenges is that we don't um, come together very well to sort of say what's needed. And often um, that's where uh, rural voice sometimes gets siloed. So it's easy mm -hmm. for people to say, like we need, you know, CDFI communities, like just give us more money to lend because access to capital is an issue. But where we have, and so everybody's kind of been in, in housing folks where I used to work before I came to Aspen, um, thought a lot about more money for housing and all those things are important. But what we weren't sort of messaging was, was more comprehensive stuff. Like I mentioned around capacity building yeah. and this uh, regionalism and this notion of sort of how these issues between environmental and economic and equity and access issues um, and health and education and work, how they interconnect and that there's more alignment that there that's possible there so that we can be telling uh, and working towards better policy outcomes at the systems level. Um, and then uh, the, the final thing I'll mention is that often in rural places, there hasn't been a real value towards um, the 
the role that rural places and communities play in stewarding natural resources mm. and um, really giving that uh, insurance of equity when um, uh, how those resources are utilized. And that's, I think, again, uh, if you're really trying to move towards sustainable rural prosperity, those things have to be true. And they haven't historically been valued that way, but that is a paradigm shift that rural communities can see how it might benefit themselves, but you have to move to a asset framework rather than yeah. a deficit viewing to kind of see the value of that. Yeah, yeah. One more piece we want to look at at the systems level, and that's those resources for productive, right. productive action. Again, system level as opposed to the, the local level. So real quick on this, obviously, what we highlight is ready rural capital access and flow. And what we mean by that is rural often gets funding in um, inconsistent levels. There's either not enough or there's sort of a big opportunity and then it goes away. This sort of consistent support is really important. And, um, and, that's, and we're really trying to take that message both to philanthropy and, and federal and state governments and, and need folks to, to echo that. The importance of rural data, you know, the lack of, of strong rural data to tell the story of what's happening in rural, particularly needing census tract data because of the size of rural counties, yeah. particularly in the Western half mm -hmm. of the United States really allows people to skew a lot of stuff and, and have funding go to places that a sense are showing need, but that's not really where the need is because it's going to the county seat versus the other communities in the county. And then again, this notion of regionalism, working together regionally to um, make systems change uh, in, on these kind of issues is really vital. Yeah, and here we are looking at the building blocks again from the systems level as a, as a whole. You know, Chris, one of the things that um, I really like about this framework is that there is the local level system block that, that that completely um, balanced is balanced out rather with the systems level. And it's important for us to remember that there are things that we can do locally to create change, but we also have to work on those systems level changes in order to mm -hmm. be successful, at least for things to be sustainable across the across time. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Now, um, one of the things that you did mention was how do we measure success? And that's important whenever we're evaluating anything. How do we know that we accomplished what it is that we wanna do? And you all are working on that as well. So quickly, let's talk about that, um, about this, uh, the principles. Yeah, and again, um, for folks who've gone to our website, you can see um, a measure up measuring six principles for measuring rural development progress uh, report on there. And there's both an executive summary and the full report, which is quite, has a, um, a glossary, a resource um, section, which is quite lengthy for folks who really wanna dive in deep on this. Uh, it came as a process of curating about um, 50, 60 people in groups of six to eight to really spend two hours with them asking this sort of, what will it take to measure rural success and what will it take to get funders to adopt these measures? And mm -hmm. so the whole report is really, um, their voice sort of coming out in our, and we synthesized it into these six principles. And, um, and again, with each of the principles, there are sets of recommendations for practitioners, government, and philanthropy. So I encourage if this is of interest to you to, to go into that. There's also a companion piece that was written by a set of practitioners, and you'll see many other resources on our website, but um, that looks at measurement and gives some sort of examples of their own um, struggles and recommendations. Mm -hmm. So the, the pieces that I really wanted to highlight here, um, number three, this notion of measuring progress relative to starting point versus just scale. One of the ways that rural communities really struggle to compete in funding is this, in a sense, the, the challenge of volume and leverage. So like how many jobs you're going to produce or how many people are going to be impacted or how much funding is going to be leveraged into this. And that's immediately in, in rural places that puts them at a disadvantage and particularly yeah. the places that are struggling the most are usually the least populated um, 
or have the least access to other resources to do this. And so really measuring relative change becomes a key component um, to being allowed to really understand success. Um, noting that, that that starting point really needs to be coming from the communities themselves, this, this sort of top-down sense of what's needed in these places does create a lot of like people trying to square peg round hole, like how do we get what we need to do fitting into this one opportunity we have for money, whether it's health and, um, and education and workforce, for example, all sort of intersector. Uh, I was with a, a, a group of folks working with opportunity youth all over the country in the past couple of days. And they were talking about the challenges of sort of financial literacy and housing and workforce and um, the challenges of uh, the, how interconnected those things are. Like if you don't, yeah. if you don't understand how to manage your resources, then you're going to have bad credit. You can't get into housing. If you're not stably housed, you're not going to last in, in education or workforce training. Exactly. Um, so those kind of like local allowing people to really determine, and then um, the. I think two other things I really wanted to highlight this using measurements of decreasing division um, and increasing effective collaboration are often things again that aren't measured a lot it's sort of just kind of quantitative outcomes, but in rural places, these become really important indicators yes. of progress and success because rural places have to work together collaboratively to be successful. And if that's not valued in the measurement, you know, and the old adage of you measure what you value. That's and, right. Um, if you're not rewarded for that, that leads to a lot of um, unnecessary competition for funding and silos. So um, the last piece we, we talk about, you'll, if you remember one of the bullets that was in our um, framework was about momentum. And that's a really important thing to capture and measure and celebrate and use mm -hmm. as a strategy. Rural places have a lot of sense of failure or can't be done or that's not ever happened here. And if you're really going to get people engaged in an inclusive way, that sense of momentum of celebrating successes along the way and building that sense of momentum, but then being able to measure that and show funders, this is a sign that your investment in our rural development hub work and our collaboration efforts and our, um, you know, measuring relative change, this is a, this is actually having success and momentum itself is an indication of progress rather than just, um, you know, have you suddenly solved um, the opioid epidemic? I, of, you know, I'm, and I'm so glad you're saying that because, you know, we have put so much um, pressure on us in terms of the outcomes only being numbers like bean counting and this all of this relationship building and um, the work that it takes to strengthen a a group or build a group or build relations that's all important and that needs to be measured so um thank you so much chris now i know some of you are, are curious about how you could possibly talk to Chris about what's happening in your own communities. His contact information is here and it's also in your resource guide. So Chris, um, I know you're gonna be joining us in, a dis in the discussion group. We are already biting into our Q&A time, but I have to ask Marjorie, if you don't mind coming back to the mic, I have to ask you, what are the next steps for the framework? And then we'll go into Q&A. Yeah, well, thanks for welcoming me back. And just to say, I am really pleased to offer that this framework is also connected to a growing wealth of tools and resources that can help us translate these concepts into action. So for example, there are numerous blogs and issue briefs that you'll find on the website that, that in the website that Chris has already chatted in that dive deeper into the local and systems level issues of this framework. Uh, and a new series of issue briefs is also forthcoming this year, representing the scholarship of researchers that are focusing on rural development issues uh, with a particular focus on issues impacting rural communities of color. And oh, wow. we've also been collaborating to develop a toolkit that can help community leaders take stock, target action, engage progress in their efforts to improve the well-being and economic prosperity of, of rural communities. And that's anticipated by the end of the year. So a lot to look forward to. And Chris, I'd invite you to say a few words about the learning exchanges. So again, our ongoing work uh, is to continue to convene um, people in a couple of different ways in the field, really trying to build and support the field of equitable rural prosperity. And we typically convene people 
um, I think it's six times a year with these open field sessions, which are topics that the field sort of lets us know they're interested in and having more discussion on. We usually have a couple of sort of kickoff speakers, but it's not presentation oriented. It's really open discussion, sharing experiences, learning from each other, and we try to facilitate that. Uh, we also do these deeper Thrive Rural Action Learning Exchanges, which I mentioned led to the Measure Up report. We have a report that just came on, came out um, about two weeks ago on what will it take to increase um, resilience and recovery from natural disasters in rural. And we have a new piece that will be out probably at the end of the year or beginning of January on um, uh, what will it take to do outdoor recreation equitably in rural, really looking at oh that nice. strategy that people have been looking at for development, but hasn't always been, um, it uh, has its own challenges um, as well as opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and so they'll continue to be um, uh, more of that going forward. Um, and um, as Marjorie said, we've, we're excited about um, both the reports that she mentioned from the researchers that, that she is helping us uh, coordinate, um, also a series of case studies to kind of feature organizations doing um, interesting work uh, that connect to the framework so you can kind of see it in action. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll mention That's two important. of those. One where we featured um, this group in North Carolina that I had done some work with before came to DC Student Action with farm workers on how they do their leadership development work with farm workers is a real example of sort of what um, both popular education and advocacy really looks like in a meaningful way. And uh, another group um, looking at uh, the preservation of uh, land for black farmers and sort of how mm -hmm. they've done their own sort of capacity building work as part of that to both teach people about the issue, but also show what real capacity building and accompaniment looks like rather from uh, versus sort of a more top down kind of doing for someone. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. And it's so good to know that, you know, we are, there's, there's research around this. This is not what you think or what you hope. These are, this is real research that's happening to be able to give um, you all the tools to be able to do your work better. So thank you so much. Um, James, do we have a, a poll to launch? Because I totally forgot to ask you to prepare one. So if we have one, I would love it. Yeah. See, that's why I love my technologists who are part of this production team. But if you feel that you can adapt some of the strategies that with, that you see happening in that Thrive Rule framework, please let us know. We are always curious about um, whether or not the tools and the resources that we offer would work for you. And then also share in the chat with Colleen any type of challenges that you think you might encounter with those tools. And um, James, you can go ahead and close that that poll right now because I want to pass this on to Joanne. I know we've had some questions that have come up. And Joanne, we have bitten into your, your Q&A time. So um, forgive us for that. <laughs> the floor is now yours. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, and yes, there are a lot of questions lined up for Chris. And I will say, folks, that some of your questions, particularly around hearing, wanting to hear more examples of rural places that are using the framework around how to engage all the necessary stakeholders um, in meaningful ways. I think those were, would be great to, for the discussion group because it, it takes longer to unpack. And we have such a short time that I want to jump into the ones that it, questions that I think Chris Chris can answer pretty succinctly. Uh, the first, Chris, is you mentioned small and medium-sized town towns and wanted to know if there was some kind of guidelines you use in terms of population size for small and medium-sized town. No, in fact, we've we've sort of stayed away from even the the sort of definition of rural um, debate, which happened. There's so many rural programs that have different definitions. There's census. There's other stuff and really tried to focus on um, thinking about your community and sort of how would you adapt the principles of the build, of the framework, the sort of building blocks and what the sort of understanding of your region um, and what, and that's really for you and others to kind of think about what your region is. Um, and so it could be, there's not a, a, a sort of, um, plan for like really small places versus medium sized places versus, um, you know, what we call rural adjacent to sort of uh, places where sprawl is kind of buffed into rural, but really um, 
trying to emphasize the flexibility and the support, what we try to do as a hub is connect people to each other. So really, if you've got you know, stories or examples or questions, we'd love to hear from you, learn more about your place. Um, if there are people doing similar work in other places, how we can connect to you on that and trying to provide resources for the for folks working across issues um, in this. Uh, we're also trying to influence philanthropy. We've done some presentations at um, regional philanthropic and state level philanthropic uh, uh, places. We have a few foundations that have already started using the framework as a kind of way to help guide their rural investments, but really trying to help people understand what's got to change um, and where investments, if you're not really thinking about some of these core issues, you may not be uh, investing in the kind of um, breakthrough that you need. So I think the, the, the other thing to say is if the, it, it's also just good to, to um, make a connection and meeting and we can chat about your place and learn more about it and think about um, uh, how we can be helpful. Yeah, that's we great, Chris. We don't consider ourselves like technical assistance people in that sense either. Yeah, but that's great because it just reinforces that the framework has a lot of flexibility to be tailored. Um, another question is around, um, you know, sort of that regional approach and trying to partner with more urban types of organizations. Are there certain types of ur urban organizations that are rising to the top in terms of um, collaborating with regional partners um, around this type of framework? So um, I think two places where that happens, um, there's a couple places where I think that happens more easily. Certainly education, because it's often countywide, um, depending on your part of the country. Obviously, I know that's not always the case, in, particularly in New England. Um, but it tends to lend itself to a regional perspective and getting um, folks efforts that are coming out of community colleges or even places that are doing, um, you know, like uh, community foundations often tend to think regionally already. Uh, folks, interestingly, folks doing infrastructure work like housing and water sewer are already thinking regionally and, um, and can come into uh, are, are important people to bring in. Um, I think the uh, health folks, which you all, I think, represent, um, you know, often have that ability to bring um, that perspective to the table about um, that I, I were, ran a continuum of care at a, um, for Wake County for a while um, while they were transitioning to new leadership. And it was really interesting to note the differences within a county where it had a large capital city, which was very urban, and then the homeless night dynamics and interventions in the rural parts of the county and how to both connect the rural parts to each other, but also the intersection between the urban interventions and things like transportation can become really important in rural places. And that's often very regionally oriented. Yeah. So some of these aren't right. as um, natural uh, allies that people may think of, but often can really come to the table with a regional perspective. Yeah. So takeaway message folks, look for those partners who already have regional systems set up. Thank you so much, Chris. And I know audience, we weren't able to get to even half of your questions. So please, please come to the discussion group because I think we'll hear more about examples and strategies as Chris has started to, to um, touch on. So we hope to see a lot of you there. Back to you, Erica. Thank you so much, Joanne. Yes, I am looking forward to that discussion group. I think it's going to be really, really active, especially if it looks like anything or what we've been seeing in the chat. Let me take this time to... Um, thank a good friend of ours, Kitty Jerome, who's joining us today. And I'm so glad that she's here. And so for you all who have um, listened to this webinar, listen to Chris and Marjorie, I would love for you to complete a survey. Um, Colleen's chatting it out now. Just let us know how we did. Let us know what you think. I want you to know that we do take into account what you say in your surveys and we try to um, produce the, the, the content in our webinars that are meaningful you for meaningful for you and will help you advance your work. So let us know what you think. You know, the last few years I've been hearing a lot about environmental equity and justice, but I'm gonna be honest, I'm not really sure what they are. 
and what's the difference between the two? So um, I know they're related to public health and I know they're important, but if you are in that space where I am, where you need to little, learn a little bit more about these terms and what that looks like in action, I wanna invite you to join me for December's webinar. We're gonna hear from two environmental justice um, advocates that are based in Madison, Wisconsin, and then an organization called Rooted, which is committed to environmental justice and equity. We'll hear from Marcia Caton Campbell and Sarah Carlson. So be sure to join us for that December 13th webinar, and you can actually sign up for it today. I want to let you know that um, before we go to our discussion group, we have made it more easier now than ever for you to search for data and resources on our website. So our colleagues at CHRNR have been working on improving those data snapshots for you. So take a look at your data snapshot today and check out the new easier ways it is to locate data and to find resources on our website. And now Colleen is chatting out the link to the discussion group that Joanne is going over to open the door for. So please be sure to join us over there. Again, this is a way that we'll be able to unpack more of what we're hearing. And Chris is gonna be there too. So make sure you're there to, to engage with Chris. And then lastly, stay in touch with us, folks. We have a presence on social media. The best way to get into, um, to learn more about our tools, resources, and webinars is to sign up for our newsletter. So be sure to do that as well. And so I will see you all on December 13th if I don't see you in the discussion group first, but thank you so much for all you do to advance equity in your communities. Have a good afternoon, everyone.